and welcome. Thank you, and thank you to Carla. Um, uh, it's impossible to say no to Carla. So um, uh, when she asked if I would be prepared to come and speak, I couldn't say no, and I didn't want to say no. But there was uh, just a moment when I was reminded of another conference that took place uh, here at the Hayes, not in uh, this room, it was before this room was built, over in the other uh, conference room, uh, that another friend from the Diocese of Chunter had asked if I would speak at. Uh, and it didn't go very well. Um, I was asked to speak, it was a, a conference of those involved in spirituality and the retreat movement, and I was asked to speak uh, on spirituality and mission. Uh, and there were a lot of people there who thought spirituality was just about spirituality and that there was uh, no way in which it should be linked with the uh, life of God's church and God's mission in his world. Uh, so I got a bit of a rough time. Uh, I'm doing the same thing this afternoon because I'm talking about ministry but I want to make it really clear at the beginning that this isn't about ministry at all. It's about uh, being equipped for God's mission in God's world. So if you don't want me to make the connection between ministry and mission, either you need to cancel the applause and boo quickly, in which case I will try and run probably through the fire exits, um, or shall we begin? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so thank you. I want to uh, I want to start um, by asking what are some of the drivers uh, for change that we need to take account of uh, as we uh, begin the journey of thinking about how <coughs> ministry should be reimagined, or rather how we should be adapting what we do in ministry because of the context in which we find ourselves now. Uh, and it seems to me that there are uh, two drivers of change. If you like, there's a heavenly driver, a theological driver, and there are some earthly factors that drive us. But I think I also want to be bold and say, uh, both the heavenly and the earthly, both the theological and the practical, <coughs> are about what God is doing amongst us. It isn't that only uh, some influence is coming from God and other influences is coming from other places. I think God is in control. Let me uh, quote a former Archbishop of Canterbury. William Temple said this. Uh, it was quoted in a report published in 1945, so he would have said it earlier, he'd already died by then. He said this, The evangelisation of England is a work that cannot be done by the clergy alone. It can only be done, to a very small extent, by the clergy at all. There can be no widespread evangelisation of England unless the work is undertaken by the lay people of the church. The main duty of the clergy must be to train the lay members of their congregation in their work of witness. And there's uh, those two drivers, the practical and the theological, are somehow in tension in this quotation. You could read it that, oh, woe is us, we don't have enough clergy. If only we had enough clergy, we could evangelise the nation. That's one way you can read it. Uh, the other is that actually this isn't a work just for the clergy, it's a work for all the people, all the priestly people of God, lay and ordained. Um, I think, um, I noticed several of you are taking photos of the slides, or maybe you're taking photos of me, that would be the most <laughs> unusual. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, a copy of the PowerPoint in PDF form, I think, is going to be emailed to you afterwards, uh, if you would like it. So, let me, uh, let me mention uh, three reports. This, uh, 
This one, uh, if there's ever a fire in my office, this is one of the books I'm going to rescue. It's the book in which that quotation is to be found, uh, Towards the Conversion of England. Uh, if you can find a copy, there's one on Amazon at the moment for £14. Bit of an increase, it was one shilling when it was published. <laughs> uh, it's well worth reading. Uh, you could, when you read it, come away with the idea, goodness, nothing changes. Uh, it's a report I really wish we had given more serious attention to, because maybe if we had, or maybe if our forebears had, we might not be meeting in quite this way, talking about this subject today. But the church has a habit of publishing reports. Um, the, um, how many of you remember the mission and ministry of the whole church, uh, published in 2007? Again, a really good read. There's a lot in there about the permanent diaconate, um, because that was sort of hot on the agenda at the time. But a huge amount theologically about how all the people of God are called to minister. And in the latest uh, theological work from the Faith and Order Commission, they've changed their, their name slightly, uh, the work on senior church leadership. If you haven't read it again, I would commend it to you. There's much to be said. How much, how much do we like change? Change, you say? Um, when did you first come to this lovely conference centre? Um, I've been coming for, I think, uh, more than 20 years. Uh, some of you may have come before me. Uh, you might remember the luxury of a single bedroom in Colditz, the former prisoner of war camp. Uh, uh, that was fortunate because you weren't sharing a room, you thought that was a luxury, uh, even though the bathrooms were shared. Um, we live in a different world. Um, this is a bit of a game. I wonder if you'd like uh, to think, just for a moment, if you could only choose six items from this list, so you can't add to it, you may have lots of ideas for what is essential for being church, there's no option for adding. If you could only have six of these, I wonder which you would choose. Coffee twice, doesn't it? Coffee twice. <laughs> It should actually it shouldn't say coffee. It should say decent coffee, shouldn't it? <laughs> I wonder what you choose. What is it that's essential about what we're doing? What's absolutely vital for the church to be engaged with uh, the mission of God, the work of Jesus Christ? What's at the heart? Because I suspect that a lot of our time in our parishes and deaneries and dioceses, and maybe even nationally, although that's shifting as we heard this morning, are looking at the things which are not central. You may not like the six that I've chosen. Uh, we've got to have people. Um, we can't cross out the risen Jesus Christ. We would want to. We can't cross out the scriptures. Uh, we can't cross out the things that Jesus told us we had to do, so we've got to have some sacraments. Uh, we can't cross out mission. That's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's what Jesus entrusted to his first disciples and he entrusts to us. Uh, and I think we can't cross out some way of overseeing the church and making sure we're linked up. Isn't that a key role, uh, not just of bishops, but of deanries? How would it be if we only focused our attention 
on the things that are really essential. And maybe that's one of the theological drivers for change as we look for ministry in God's church uh, now and in the future. We need to keep the main thing, the main thing. Let me move then to some of the practical drivers for change. And these will be painfully familiar to you. Uh, we've been uh, living for a long time with seemingly diminishing resources. Uh, you will probably know better than I, the average giving of a Church of England uh, member across the country, I think is a whisker over 3.5% of disposable income. Is that about right? Uh, we've been trying for as long as I have been ordained to say that it should be 5%. Uh, and we would all know that if everyone gave 5%, we would have more money than we knew what to do with. But seemingly, we've got fewer and fewer resources. Clergy pensions has been one of the issues. All sorts of factors. And I can remember for, for the, the entirety of my ordained ministry, there has been talk about how do we save money, uh, which gets uh, linked up with... Uh, how do we have fewer stipendiary clergy? And somehow we've got to get out of that conversation. Uh, clergy numbers uh, actually are not dependent on finance. Uh, there are other things. Uh, I was looking at the statistics. Uh, in 1901, apparently, we had 23,000 ordained ministers. Uh, and in those days, they must all have been stipendiary. Uh, in 1999, that number had dropped to 9,762. That seems a remarkably accurate figure. Um, in 2015, the national statistics tell us we have 8,000 stipendiary parish clergy plus 3,300 self-supporting ministers, 6,480 with permission to officiate, and 2,670 others. Uh, others, uh, about half of the others are chaplains. <coughs> so that you will hear some people saying, we have never had more ministers than we have today. So if you add up uh, all of those last few, you're not that far away from the position it was in 1901, which apparently was the year we had our maximum number of clergy. But there's a factor that's ignored in this, which is population. Because our population hasn't remained the same. Uh, it has increased significantly since 1900, and there are huge demographic shifts happening for good or ill in our country at the moment. Um, uh, those of us in the southeast are seeing huge increases in population and we don't quite know how to keep up with them. And then, of course, there's the issue of the age of our clergy. In Chelmsford, I was looking at the statistics over the last 10 years, 2006 to 2016. These aren't on the screen. In that time, our population has increased by 11% to just over 3 million people. Our geographical area, not surprisingly, has stayed exactly <coughs> the same, about 1,500 square miles. Our number of stipendiary clergy has dropped from 425 to 354. That's a drop of 17%. We've closed a few churches, 3%. It's a very few. Interestingly, the number of parishes has declined by exactly the same percentage as the number of clergy, 17% less now, 465 instead of 562. We have a declining ministerial number and a massively increased population. 
And even within our diocese, the, uh, the moves are, uh, are significant. Some of our parishes are declining in size, and others right the way across the diocese, not just uh, in the East London boroughs, but in uh, places like Colchester, uh, the population is growing hugely. Uh, this chart uh, shows the age of our stipendiary clergy in 2014, so the, the years need to shift by two uh, if we want to be accurate today. Uh, I, don't, I think we are slightly worse, slightly older than the national average, uh, only slightly. But you see this huge peak in the number of our stipendiary ministers around the age of 60. Uh, and so we have coined the phrase, um, uh, I don't know whether others are using it or whether indeed we may have stolen it, of the demographic tsunami. That uh, we are approaching a time when huge numbers of our paid clergy are going to retire. We are just coming up to the beginning of that big peak. It's going to hit us uh, particularly from 2018. And there is absolutely nothing we can do about it. And it's made worse by the age of our self-supporting clergy, who are on average a little bit older than our stipendiary clergy. And okay, our self-supporting ministers um, are going to likely to stay in the diocese. Most of our stipendiary <coughs> ministers move out of the diocese when they retire. Um, uh, they tend to go to um, uh, either slightly cheaper places to live uh, or slightly uh, nicer places to live. Relatively few retire within our borders. If you are about to retire, you would be very welcome to come and join us. <laughs> um, so overall, we have uh, a crisis in ministry. It's nothing, it's nothing less than that. We only realised we had a crisis, seriously I think, in 2010. We'd known for a long time that our numbers were diminishing, but finance was diminishing and they seemed to be roughly in balance. Um, uh, we, um, you know, so we've, we've salami sliced, we've taken a little bit off here, a little bit off there, we've given uh, clergy a few more parishes to look after, particularly in the rural areas. It's the same pattern I know right the way across the country. And we probably thought, well, we can just carry on doing that and it'll be all right, won't it? But actually, with these statistics, no, it won't be all right. Finance is no longer the driver. We can afford more clergy than are available to us. And, well, okay, uh, we heard this morning of the 50% uh, increase in vocations that the National Church is calling for. Uh, we have seen a 50% increase in the number of offering for ordained ministry in the last 10 years. That's partly because 10 years ago we were at a low end, uh, so I don't want to don't want to claim uh, uh, too much from that. Uh, we have seen more people offering for stipendiary ministry and self-supporting ministry. And we're beginning to see that those offering for ministry are doing so in two places. The younger are offering, uh, and so you can see a peak on this graph around the age of 34, but a good number younger. Uh, we're not the best in the country for young vocations by any means but we are beginning to attract more younger people. We're also recognising that we have experienced ministers, uh, readers, LLNs, uh, who are being called into ordained ministry later in life. And we have a significant number of people recognising a vocation in their uh, 50s and indeed in their 60s. This, though, is not going to be the answer to our problems, at least not just yet. Again, this was a diagram we produced in 2014. Uh, it shows the, uh, uh, the gradual decline of our stipendiary numbers, 
and uh, the tail at the end as it fans out uh, the bottom one is this is where we're going if we don't do anything this was in 2014 uh, and uh, the um, the other lines represent 10% more ordinands, 25% more ordinands, 50% more ordinands from 2014. At the moment, we've seen a 30% increase on average in the number offering for ordained ministry, SSM and stipendium. Uh, that curve doesn't turn around very quickly. And yes, there are things that we're looking at now. Can we, can we shorten the vocational discernment process? I think in some ways we can. Can we shorten the time it takes from the beginning of entering theologi theological education to, to the time we can trust someone to be an incumbent? Yes, I think for some people we can do that. But it's not going to change the position radically. We know that we are not going to have more stipendiary ministers, or indeed more ministers at all, paid or unpaid, uh, until after 2025. How are we feeling? Depressed? Fed up? Wishing it were all different? Uh, Gerard Hughes, uh, the, um, uh, the author, in one of his books, uh, repeatedly in the introduction to it, uses these words. God is in the facts. God is in the facts. Or as our excellent diocesan secretary uh, says, facts are friendly. We need to know the reality. If we don't, we're going to be living in cloud cooking. And my fear is that there are some dioceses in the Church of England who are still living in cloud cooking land, who are saying we are not going to reduce our stipendiary numbers. Well, unless there are some dioceses who are not going to play fair with the rest of us, are going to, and are going to try and recruit uh, more than their fair share, whatever that is, it is an impossibility over the next 10 years. We cannot carry on as we are. And so it was in recognition of that that uh, when Stephen, our new bishop, arrived in 2010, uh, he set about uh, going around the diocese, listening uh, to uh, <coughs> clergy and lay people, going to uh, synods and various meetings. It's what new bishops always do. Uh, but unlike a lot of new bishops who say, we need a new diocesan strategy, he didn't do that. Thank God. <coughs> what he did was he said, I think there are four questions we need to be asking ourselves. How should we inhabit the world distinctively? How, how can we evangelise effectively? How can we serve with accountability? And how can we reimagine ministry? Uh, we had a huge uh, Darson consultation. We had a thousand of us gathering uh, together for a day. Uh, and from that, um, we have been working since 2012 on uh, these four questions. Uh, and at the beginning of this year, we had another gathering of nearly a thousand people to say, are these still the right questions? And we are entirely confident that these need to be priorities for us. Transforming presence isn't of itself a strategy, but it does give us some strategic directions and priorities to follow. Uh, it was uh, republished earlier this year uh, in written form looking like this. Uh, if you want to find, uh, well I've got two of these copies with me, the first two who uh, trip me up afterwards can have one. Um, we've given uh, little cards like this which uh, uh, open up 
deliberately. Yes, it isn't too corny, I hope, into a cross shape. Uh, and we've given them to all our congregations. There are a larger number on the table at the back, and I see one or two of you who have picked them up. Do, do grab one if you'd like. Uh, there is a website address on the back. In fact, if you search Google Transforming Presence, you will find all the resources, and you can see what we've done. I don't offer it to you as a model for you to follow. Uh, I think it's really important that what we do has to be contextually relevant. We can't take a strategic framework for one diocese off a website and apply it somewhere else. That would be bonkers. What, what is God calling uh, you to do in your particular place? But these four questions uh, seem to be important for us at the moment. How do we... Uh, how do we live as Christians? Do others notice that our Christian faith is important to us? We wondered very seriously, could we get a Chelmsford rule of life that would work for all our congregations and all the believers who worship with us? Uh, some diocese have attempted it, perhaps yours is one. In the end, we decided we couldn't. Uh, there is such diversity in the Chelmsford Diocese uh, that any way that we expressed it, we thought that we would, uh, some people would like it and others would rebel against it. But we felt that the cross <coughs> was perhaps the one symbol uh, that no one could say, we don't like that. <laughs> And so we had the idea, uh, a very simple idea, not original, of producing holding crosses. Uh, what perhaps is original is the shape of our holding crosses, and uh, you can see uh, on the slide that they tessellate together. Uh, when we launched them, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury blessed um, hundreds of them stretched out across the chancel in the cathedral. And we thought that was important. Of, of seeing that actually we are interdependent and we link together. Uh, there's the text of um, uh, the, uh, the primary call uh, to love our neighbours as ourselves. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we had these crosses made in two places. Some were made in our companion diocese in Kenya and others were made in the UK from redundant church pews. <laughs> and if you've got some church pews, you wouldn't mind getting rid of What better use? Uh, that the things that people have sat on to pray uh, continue to be used in prayer. Uh, it's made a difference. We're using them in schools. We're using them at confirmations, at baptisms, at marriages. Uh, there are uh, countless people now who are carrying around a holding cross in their pocket uh, and it is making a difference to them and to their discipleship. There's a lot more we need to do and next year uh, we are having uh, a year particularly focusing on the discipleship theme. Uh, this year, um, Evelyn Underhill you will have heard of, she was warden of our retreat house at Pleshy in the past. We're making use of her anniversary to encourage a renewal in the life of prayer. Uh, evangelising effectively. Uh, having an evangelist for a bishop won't surprise you to know that Stephen has given this uh, high attention. Uh, and in our centenary year in 2014, uh, rather than asking people to celebrate the past, we said, please do something that's going to build the future. And we challenged uh, every benefice, every parish, to put on some sort of mission weekend in 2014. Uh, Stephen single-handedly did a series of training evenings around all our deaneries, and the fruit has been really encouraging. We need to do more. We need to be seeing more that we can do in our church schools. Uh, and our, uh, our latest buzzword is that we are encouraging, and we'll see mission and ministry units in a minute, uh, that we're asking every part of the diocese 
to be naming their strategic mission priority areas. Where do we need to be putting resources in order to follow what God is up to? Uh, and we are at the moment uh, making a bid for the money that John Spence was talking about this morning uh, in order to build some of our resource churches and to do more work in church planting. I'm sorry to go through the earlier ones, but reimagining ministry is the last, and it's the last for an important reason. The third, serving with accountability, and it's this one that we've had most difficulty with. But in a sense, it's the most important. For years, we have had uh, the clergy and lay leaders of some of our parishes saying something like this. Why should we be paying our parish share in full when the lot next door aren't doing anything? I could express that more graphically, but I better not because this is being recorded. But you get the idea. Um, why is it that we are not exercising our ministry with accountability between clergy, between lay people, between parishes, between deaneries? Surely there are some expectations that we should have of each other in ministry that we can hold each other to account. Uh, this isn't the topic of, uh, of today. Um, you can read more about what we've come up with. It's nothing revolutionary. Uh, we've got nine criteria uh, that we have asked all our parishes to think about. We've done that through the Archdeacon visitation. We did that last year. Uh, and we, have also, we are also using uh, money from our first strategic bid to the church commissioners uh, to work in turnaround, identifying uh, those parishes who are significantly underperforming for some reason and finding ways of intervening and helping and supporting to turn them around. Uh, because it's no good um, holding someone to account and saying, well, yeah, we've, we've got it right and you've got it wrong, unless we can also put some resources in to help those who aren't uh, cutting the mustard. So, here we are at the title I was given. How have we gone about reimagining ministry in the Diocese of Chelmsford? There are a number of strands. One of the most important was that we asked ourselves as a diocese, is our leadership structured in the best way to enable the change that we know needs to happen over the next 10 years? And our conclusion was that we weren't. We recognised that we needed more senior resource to oversee the organisational and the cultural change that we needed uh, to implement. And that's why we made uh, national news by nearly doubling the number of our archdeacons. We moved from four to seven. We've, we made some other changes in the way uh, we're led as well. It is beginning to make a difference. Archdeacons are now able to spend more time, a lot of our archdeaconries were huge, um, they're now of a more average size, and our archdeacons are able to spend more time uh, with area deans and lay chairs working through the change that's needed in each locality, and in most places that's working pretty well. We've invested heavily uh, in vocation and selection work. So we've moved from having uh, one DDO to having uh, one DDO and two half-time DDOs. Uh, we are seeing uh, a record number of people uh, exploring ordination. And it looks like that by 2018 <coughs> we might be net exporters. We have a young vocation scheme 
uh, that has started well. We're actually reviewing it this year to see how we might build on it. Uh, we, are, uh, we are making uh, much more use, uh, much greater focus, not just on ordained ministry, but on lay ministry. Um, so we have, uh, we have two centres now training uh, uh, authorised pioneer ministers. We have, um, we have stopped training readers, uh, and it isn't simply a change of cover, um, not just a respray. Uh, we're calling them licensed lay ministers. Uh, we're doing that for a purpose, um, so that each of them now are, are trained in adult education skills uh, in order to deliver the amount of uh, locally based training that the diocese is asking for. And we have shifted very dramatically in the last five years from expecting all our lay ministers to go through extensive training before they start ministering to saying, here's permission, get on with it. We want to see what you can do and we will provide training on the job. This is a big shift. I, before I was ordained, I, I was a, a reader. And when I trained as a reader in the Diocese of Chelmsford, while I was training, I was <coughs> prohibited from preaching. We weren't allowed to preach until after we'd been licensed. Can you think of anything more ridiculous? How did anyone know that I might or might not be able to preach? I thank God that my rector at the time did not sit uh, entirely to the letter of the law. <laughs> so, change in leadership. Greater emphasis on vocations, and I, I, I'm sorry, I've, I've highlighted ordained vocations. Um, a number of you will be, will be itching to ask me the question about uh, vocation being something for all God's people. Yes, of course it is, uh, and uh, that is very much an emphasis in our lay training programmes. <coughs> and lastly, mission and ministry units. That's what I want to talk about. That's what we are uh, using as, as terminology, and I want to unpack that a bit more. Before I do, uh, let me just offer a few key phrases from uh, Transforming Presence. As we have uh, looked at it again, uh, four years on from starting, a few things are becoming clear that we need to emphasize. We are looking uh, for God's church to be more luminous and more transparent. We need to be open. Uh, we need to be open with each other and honest with each other in the diocese. It doesn't good, uh, it's no good holding secrets. Um, it's no good not involving lots of people in the decisions that need to be made. This is, this is not a top-down initiative. It's a set of questions and a framework that needs to be fleshed out and implemented at the most local level. We recognise that as Christians we are to be formed as disciples of Christ in order to be sent. So what happens on a Sunday morning, or picking up from the conversation you had uh, this morning, uh, whenever your Sunday worship happens to take place. Uh, we have one of our East End uh, parishes, uh, who I think it was about 10 years ago, uh, the vicar had to get permission from the bishop to stop having a morning service, and their main act of worship is at four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, our gatherings are to form us in order that we might be sent. We want more church for more impact. We do not want to be closing churches. We do not want to be amalgamating churches into some sort of lowest common denominator that it's sort of a bit of a grey mush of church. We want all our different traditions to thrive and to be missional. 
And we want some more churches to be planted and to grow. We want more church. And the lack of uh, stipendiary ministers should not stop us growing each and every church. Okay, uh, like every diocese I suspect, we have some church buildings which are not in the right place and we have some churches perhaps that ought to close, but that's not our priority. Our priority is for more. Uh, and so we're talking about a priest for every parish and a ministry in every place. Like the quote uh, that I started with, it was interesting for us to discover that our bishop in the 1950s said this, 600 clergy cannot win for Christ and his church the great county of Essex. Um, in those days, of course, the, uh, our five East London boroughs were within the county of Essex. 600 clergy? We'd give our eye teeth for 600 <coughs> clergy. Or would we? Maybe, maybe that would inhibit mission across the board amongst all God's people in our diocese. Our projection for 2025 is that in 2025 uh, and therefore a sustainable minimum number of paid clergy from which we can increase we think is 215. We've got a lot more work to do to enable mission to thrive with fewer stipendiaries and you've seen some of the ways in which we're doing it. So let me talk uh, for a little bit about mission and ministry units uh, and this is this is the last section of the talk so although I will slightly go on beyond 45 minutes uh, I won't go on for too much longer. Why on earth are we calling these new organisational units mission and ministry units. Let me tell you, we debated for hours in Bishop's staff and on Bishop's council uh, and in Diocesan Synod, hours and hours and hours about what we should call these things. Uh, people were much more attracted to, I think, is it the Exeter terminology of missional communities or mission communities? Uh, the same sorts of things are happening all over the place. The Church in Wales is doing it. Lots of dioceses are doing something similar. Uh, the reason we have stuck with Mission and Ministry Unit is that we hope this describes what we're looking for, that it is to do with mission, that it is to do with ministry, and it is about a unit, a group of people together. But we do not want any of our MMUs to be called that. We want the inventive title to come locally. And so we are now seeing some people talking about community, some people talking about covenant. Uh, it's important that the language works locally rather than having a blanket word that applies to the diocese. That's why uh, we've chosen such an ugly term. It is vital for us that our mission and ministry units <coughs> primarily have a mission focus. Let me say that's been quite difficult to implement. Because our default is to say, okay, if we've got to reorganise, let's look for our friends, can we, can we buddy up with them? Uh, where are the easy groupings for us to belong to? Uh, and therefore we hold an internal discussion, what's comfortable for us as church now, rather than being outward looking and say, how do we need to be structured in order for the gospel to spread in the communities that we serve? Uh, so this is a drum that we're having to bang and continue to bang as our mission and ministry units are being formed. It's for the mission focus that we want our units to be geographic. 
We've had a lot of kickback on that. Because inevitably, there are some parishes uh, who are isolationists for a whole variety of reasons. It might be because of their particular tradition. It might be because they just never had liked the parish next door or never trusted the parish next door, never mind about theology. Uh, we are fine on our own. That is not good enough. We are called here to serve a population, a geographic area, a community. And yes, it is very difficult for some of our reform parishes and some of our forward in faith parishes to engage with this process. Some of them are beginning to do so, and we know it's going to take time. We can't force people into a relationship with someone else they don't trust. We've got a few years to do it. But we want our mission and ministry units to be diverse. God's people are not uniform. We're not supposed to be uniform. We will discover unity only in our diversity. So we don't want to, um, to squash church traditions at all. We want every part of the church to thrive. It's not easy. It's vital that these units are collaborative. That too is not easy. How long have we been talking about collaborative ministry? How long have we had local ministry schemes? Uh, it's at least as far back as the 80s. Of course, it actually goes back to the New Testament. Uh, we somehow, in our in our DNA, have an isolationist view. It's, it is slowly changing, but we haven't got there yet. There was talk this morning about administration, and we are, uh, we're trying to offer the model. We've, we found it difficult to find a way of expressing what we're talking about here. Uh, the best that we've come up with is that we think that each mission and ministry unit needs somebody like a practice manager in a doctor's surgery. Someone who is more than a parish secretary. Someone who's got um, uh, some more uh, skills and abilities to, to do some of the strategic work in organisation and fundraising and use of resources um, uh, that can release not just clergy but lay people too uh, for the work of uh, mission. And this last one is one that we've struggled about. We, uh, we were clear three or four years ago that focal minister was a really important term for us. We imagined that every congregation needed a focal minister, whether that was a, a stipendiary clergy person or whether it was a reader or a lay person, uh, that there would be somebody we would call the focal minister. The reason we have decided not to do that is that we feared that there would be lay people who wanted to occupy those roles more for a sense of their own status and authority uh, rather than out of a heart of service. And the danger for us is that just as we've got far more people exercising a one-man ordained ministry, and we've got some women who do a one-woman ordained ministry, but it's more men, we didn't want to replicate uh, a one-person lay ministry trying to control and run a local congregation. So we are we're struggling to know what to call those people who, who are exercising a focal minister, but we're making it really clear that whatever roles you have, it needs to be part of a local ministry team doing it together. We have a key role for the Archdeacon and for the Deanery in the formation of mission and ministry units. It's primarily a responsibility for deaneries. What works on the ground? It's no good for people like me uh, to, to draw lines on a map in the diocesan office. Um, that's just ridiculous. It has to be done locally. Uh, it's tricky because it also has to recognise that some deanery boundaries are nonsensical and for mission we need to be working across boundaries. 
It's not easy. We recognise that leadership is really important. It was a question for us. Of our 215 uh, stipendiary ministers, uh, what percentage of those do we think have got the oversight skills to be the leaders of mission and ministry units? Now, I'm not, uh, um, please don't misunderstand me. Uh, we imagine that some of our units will be lay led, but, but initially the likelihood is they will be led by stipendiary clergy. Have we got enough people up to the task? And we reckon that we'll end up with between 60 and 70 mission and ministry units, which says roughly 25% of our stipendiary workforce has to have some strategic <coughs> oversight ability, a more Episcopal vicar, if you like. We think that's just about possible. Uh, we won't, um, we won't commission uh, a mission and ministry unit unless we are confident, and the area bishops do this, that the unit is viable and can flourish. Uh, there's no point in pulling a group of parishes together, asking their clergy and lay leaders to collaborate if there are not sufficient resources to make it sustainable. That's quite a challenge. We want no isolated ministers or isolated congregations. We're not imposing any new legal structures. In fact, we are resisting telling uh, MMUs how they should organise because I think there is quite enough flexibility in teams and groups uh, to start working. Uh, and I'm sure that the legalities can follow. And what about our deans? If the shift is happening over the next five years from uh, deaneries being a strategic unit to something smaller, our mission and ministry units, what does that say for the role of the deanery in future? And we don't know the answer. We do know it's a question, and it could be that we will end up saying our deaneries need to become smaller and MMUs need to be a deanery. Or, conversely, deaneries should become bigger, uh, maybe to the extent that each archdeaconry, now that we've got seven of them, is a deanery. Uh, or it could be something in the middle. We know that uh, both the geographic and the size of deaneries will end up changing, but we, end up, we don't want to impose it. We think it will happen naturally as uh, as the units embed and start working, and I'm sure that if we tried to impose it now, A, it wouldn't work, and B, we'd get it wrong. Okay. So, what are some of the issues we're facing? Yes, we do have even in the glorious diocese of Chelmsford, some people who won't play ball. Well, so be it. Uh, as one of our area bishops uh, once said, where there is death, there's hope. <laughs> None of us are going to be around forever. Um, actually, some of our recalcitrant so-and-sos will still be around in 2025, but who knows, as others change, maybe those who we think are impossible blocks now will see the world and the church differently. We need to have hope that God is at work in his church and that God is at work amongst us, those of us who are called to leadership in his church, and sometimes we've got to change our minds. The change in culture is enormous. We are too isolationist. We are too parochial, we're too reliant on ordained clergy, um, and that's not just an issue for those who are ordained, it's sometimes a cultural issue for those who are lay, who expect the ordained to do everything. There is a huge uh, change that needs to happen, and it takes time. Uh, one of our uh, lay leaders in the diocese uh, 
uh, in conversation with me about a year ago. Uh, he does um, change work in large organisations, um, government departments, uh, big companies. And he said to me, Roger, uh, strategic change takes three years. Um, I don't think that's true. Uh, I think uh, we've changed a lot in the time that I've been ordained, but we've changed pretty slowly. I hope we can change a bit more quickly. Uh, I was helped more by somebody else who says that it takes, in an organisation, it takes two years for every layer of accountability in an organisation. That's a bit more realistic, perhaps. But we're looking for a task. Well, of course, it is a task that will never be finished. We're always called to be reformed, aren't we? But this particular task, I suspect, is at least a 10-year task, uh, which is why uh, 2025 is our horizon. Uh, I've talked about working with difference. Uh, this last one, uh, deanery equals unit. This isn't about the future of the deanery. It's about how big the unit should be. And our first unit, which is going to be uh, commissioned uh, quite soon, uh, the whole deanery is going to become a unit. It makes perfect sense. Uh, it's one of our more rural deaneries. It's the deanery of Saffron Walden. There is a large church in the middle of Saffron Walden that acts a bit like a minster. It doesn't have that title formally. Uh, it's a big team ministry. Uh, the deanery already work really well together. Uh, it's clear that there are resources in the centre of the deanery that work well for everybody. Uh, we're really pleased. What we're not pleased about is that quite a number of other deaneries have said no. So Saffron Walden have said deanery equals unit. That saves all the work, doesn't it? We'll be a unit too. Um, we all would like a quick fix. And so pushing back to say, well, what are the reasons you want to be a unit as a deanery? Um, what does that mean? What are the, what are the priorities? Why, what, why is this going to work for mission in your context in a way that simply being a deanery may not have done up until now? Um, there are issues that we need to focus on. Uh, I said a little bit about uh, changing lay ministry at the beginning. Uh, I think at the moment we have three lay people uh, who are overseeing congregations. And we don't quite know what to call them. Uh, is it lay incumbent or lay vicar or is it focal minister, whatever it is. Uh, two of them are readers or LLNs and one person is entirely unqualified in ecclesiastical terms. He has no licence but he's commissioned for it. Um, we've even uh, put him in the vicarage. Uh, he is actually a lay, lay leader. Do you know that term? Uh, it was uh, coined, I think, in the research done on fresh expressions by George Lings, uh, where he was noticing that some of our most successful uh, fresh expressions of church were overseed, overseen by those with no training whatsoever, or no formal training whatsoever. And I suspect he may be onto something. And the last area which um, has emerged for us in the last year um, is about interim and transitional ministry. Uh, the need to find people who can work with a congregation for a limited period of time. Uh, I wish I could talk more about that, uh, but I must stop. Some implications. We are going to make mistakes. There's no magic blueprint for doing this work. Uh, we've got to get used to the idea that change and transition is business as usual. It isn't that we've just got to put extra effort in for a few years and then everything is going to come right. I'm convinced that change has to be business as usual. We need more of a shift from prior training to learning on the job. Uh, for those 
uh, in ordained ministry, we invest far too much pre-ordination and nothing like enough post-ordination. Uh, we need to develop um, uh, leadership abilities more. And it's only just getting on the agenda of, uh, of our theological ed education institutes. Uh, we need to learn from each other. Uh, and I was really pleased to see the leaflet at the back uh, about learning communities between deaneries. Um, we as a diocese have been involved in a learning community with eight other dioceses. Um, uh, taking the risk of exposing what we're doing and what's working and what's not working in partnership with other people doing something similar uh, is a really important thing to do. Uh, and the growth uh, of maybe a shift from formal training to coaching and mentoring on the job, I think, are important things. I've gone on for too long. Have a quick conversation on your table, uh, if you would. How does all this relate to where you are? Does it, does it have any relevance at all? Uh, how might we learn better together? How can we support each other on this journey of change? And what questions does it raise for you? Thank you.